Today I'm out in northern Minnesota and I'm going out with the biologist from the Voyager's Wolf Project. Now, if you're not into wolf biology or wild wolf conservation, this might be a boring video, but if you are, it should be pretty interesting. So the other day I got a post on Facebook that Voyager's Wolf Project was doing a field trip and had two spots open. They said to call a certain number if I wanted to go. I thought about it for a few seconds and then I started checking flights and yes, it looked like I could go. So I called, got on and then got the plane tickets, rental car and hotel. Ah, ready to go. So who is Voyager's Wolf Project? Well. They're a group of biologists studying the wolf population in, in and around Voyager's National Park. These guys have done some groundbreaking research using traps, game cameras, and GPS collaring, and they have blown up on social media too. They have captured video of wolves fishing and stalking beavers, which previously had not been done. In fact, nobody even knew that wolves stalked anything at all. Usually they just chase their prey when they see them. So needless to say, I was stoked to be going out with these guys. Um, Thomas Gable is the project leader for Voyager's Wool Project, and he was the main guide on this trip. The first place we went was their main storage area where they showed us their traps, their GPS stuff, and um, some of their cameras and equipment. This was interesting. Capture a wolf, and we'll talk about how we do that in a minute. Um, this is our basic capture kit. Um, it's got everything we need organized, like you know. Um, and the first thing we do when we get a wolf, we open the tackle box. <laughs> um, and basically, once the wolf is caught in the foothold trap that we have it in, um, this sophisticated piece of equipment is a broom handle and a syringe goes on the end of it. And we put drugs in the syringe and there's a needle on the end of it, of course. And so we put a, a mixture of two different drugs in the end of this and then um, position the wolf with a couple of people that its hip is towards the person who's drugging and then that is pressed into the wolf and the drug is expelled into the muscle tissue and about five to ten minutes later the wolf takes about a 45 minute nap while we process it um, and then we're taking samples uh, like um, blood and hair and for genetics and disease and that kind of stuff um, and then the primary thing we're doing is putting a GPS collar on the wolf um, this is one of those collars, batteries on the bottom, and the GPS is on the top. Um, and these collars are designed and they're pre-programmed to fall off at a certain amount of time. Basically, this battery won't last forever. Um, and so once we pre-program so that right before the battery dies, um, right here on the side of this, this becomes unhinged. And the collar just flops off and the GPS is still working so we can go find it, replace the battery. Um, and that kind of ideally is the cycle that we go through over and over again. Um, one thing real quick about that battery worth noting, so that's we've got two different size GPS collars and when you're putting a collar on a wolf you want to size it based on the size of the wolf. Um, and so what we're typically trying to do is put a GPS collar on a wolf that is 3% or less of the animal's body weight, which has been sort of shown as a, a level that it really doesn't impact the animal in any negative way. Um, that collar is a little bigger. It's actually got three lithium um, battery cells in it. Uh, the other one we have only has two and that just changes the weight a bit. So that one looks a little bigger and that is only put on the biggest wolves that we catch. Um, most wolves in our study area wouldn't be able to support that or go past that threshold of about 3%. Um, but the bigger the battery, the more data you can get from that collar and the longer it will last. So when we do get bigger animals uh, that meet that, you know, we put that on. Typically they're gonna be breeding males, the dominant males or two to three year old males. Those are going to be about the only ones that are big enough that a breeding female won't be able to wear that collar. So just want to touch on that real quick. 
Wolf traps are probably the most common way that wolves are caught for research purposes um, in forested ecosystems where you can't readily observe them. Um, what we have here, you kind of see there's a, a difference. You've got these traps that look black, really black and you know different, and these look rusted. And actually, they're the same traps. These have just been dyed. So you actually dye the metal um, so that it's black and it actually preserves it from not corroding. And these, you know, you can see they're rusting, so we need to preserve them. Um, these are specifically designed for research purposes. Um, you know, people aren't using these to catch wolves just for recreation. And part of that, because these tra cost a lot more money. But one of the reasons these are used for research, for how you can tell, is they have these rubber laminated or padded jaws on the inside, which is meant to actually hold the wolf's foot in a way that's not going to injure it. If it was just straight metal, that would be a totally different situation. So if these have been totally tweaked and um, and modified for research purposes. And uh, you can also see that continues throughout actually the rest of the trap. So, so there's two things that are important when you're using traps to catch animals. One is how's it holding the wolf's foot. But actually what's more important is then the chain that the trap is connected to. Um, because if that's not done correctly, that's where you can actually get a lot of the injuries isn't actually the, the holding the animal's foot, but actually when it tries to struggle, if it can't pivot and move, it can get itself worked up and actually hurt, injure itself that way. What do you want to talk about? Yeah, that? so one of the biggest ways we try to help the wolf's shoulder is that um, first, and then instead of staking these, these traps to the ground where they are, we have a big drag. The wolf takes off to the woods and this slowly gets caught up on vegetation and that slowly slows them down rather than them hitting the end of the chain and hurting their shoulder. Um, and so that's one thing that we have. So wolf slowly gets caught. This gets tangled in vegetation. They slow down. And then once they stop, they start, will usually start circling and get caught in more and more vegetation. Um, and throughout the chain, we have at least four swivels in this trap. So when the wolf is caught, they can't be twisting its shoulder in any way. And that goes for anywhere that it's caught on the chain, depending on how wrapped up it is. And then early on in the chain, there's this spring with a swivel on either end of it, so that if they are pushing and pulling on it, there's a little bit of give. And that also is in addition to the vegetation being soft. And so the, the whole idea there is obviously we have no interest in hurting a wolf, and uh, we want it to be as you know unharmed as possible when it when it leaves with a collar. Um, so all those things are there to help keep the wolf preserved and healthy. Um, and then by the time we get there, we're checking these traps every day, sometimes twice a day, um, to make sure the wolf isn't in the trap very long. Um, and both those things all help to kind of make it eventually just kind of settle down and wait for us to come the next morning when it gets hot. So, yeah, and so uh, additional modifications on things like this that we've done as well are like, um, you can change the strength of how strong that trap is to hold a wolf, and so we change these to basically be just strong enough to actually hold the animal, but not so strong it's going to actually hurt the animal. So there's a lot of precaution and testing and sort of fiddling with these in sort of the off season to make sure they're really set up well for catching and collaring wolves and also releasing them unharmed because uh, that would be really detrimental really to our research if the animal isn't behaving like a wolf after it's been collared and all of our efforts after that aren't really going to be that fruitful because we're, we're not actually studying the animal as it actually lives in the landscape. Um, so there's a lot of effort and time that goes into this. Catching wolves is, you know, even with the equipment that's set up well, wolves are very smart, they're very intelligent, and they're very hard to actually capture. They just are, are too smart. I mean, if you think about it this way, a wolf's territory around here is going to be a thousand or 100 to 150 square kilometers, and you're trying to get maybe one of four animals in that pack to step on something the size of a silver dollar, right? And you've got to somehow get it to do that, and they really are going to do that willingly. Um, so there's a lot of challenges and things like that um, to doing that. Next, we went to see this ranch where the project had put up some fencing around this huge ranch where wolves had been predating on the rancher's livestock. And... As a result, the federal government was coming in and killing lots of these wolves, some of which were research wolves. And so this fence was put up, got some donations in, and it's basically put a stop to the ranchers' killing of livestock and the killing of wolves. Then we went to investigate a bear bait site where wolves had been showing up. So what hunters often do is they actually We'll also use the roots of trees and shove like stuff up under them so the animals have to work to get it out. 
Um, and so what was going on, you can see the deer, or the stand, is right up behind us. Oh, yeah. See that, the yeah. hunting stand right there? Mm -hmm. And so we're off of that, it's probably another spot that they were putting bait out, like up in that tree there. And so they were doing that, and then all of this is, they probably just walked in food, and so our wolves came here and just, you know, were eating food and digging it out of here. And they probably spent, uh, given that number of locations, 20 hours here, 24 hours. And that's just where they're probably feeding here. That's not just total time. So this area just becomes like a little hub of activity. And then typically bear hunters are dropping this food every couple days, every day or something like that. So this really is just sort of like a wolf buffet uh, and a bear buffet. Um, a lot of bear hunters say that when wolves take over their pile, they don't see a lot of bears, which might be true, I'm not sure. Um, but certainly this becomes important. And at this time of year, a lot of wolves actually, their pups actually start hanging out around these sites too. So they often become rendezvous sites, which is why in places like Wisconsin, where you hear about issues where they're running hounds uh, from uh, on bears and they're using bait piles to start those, in those sort of chases where you have issues because those hounds are going into places where wolves are having their pups and it's becoming a, an area of conflict uh, as a result. Um, this is actually probably one of the more obscure bait piles we've been to. Most of them where they drive in with an ATV and they cut big logs that are probably about this big and then they dig a hole and they put all the logs on top of it with rocks and then the wolves are digging underneath here. There's actually videos on YouTube where you can go to if you type in like wolves and bear bait, you'll find videos of wolves like grabbing the logs with their teeth and moving them off of the bait pile and stuff like that um, just so they can get food. So. Um, so anyways, so bear baiting is, moral of the story is it's a big food source for wolves. Um, not saying that's a good or a bad thing, just, just what it is. Um, Next we went to a beaver dam and a beaver pond where there was actually a wolf kill and um, wolves had been hanging out in the for area. One, two, three. And they are all maps associated with this kill site that we're at here. And I, one thing I don't think we did a probably a very good job of introducing is how we actually like go about finding these spots in sort of a systematic fashion. Um, the way we find these kills is we visit clusters of GPS locations. So anytime our collared wolves put out two locations within a 200 meter area of one another, we consider that a cluster. And so we visit every cluster of locations. And the idea there is that anywhere they spend more than 20 minutes could possibly be a kill site. And so we need to go visit, figure out what's going on. So this is the spot we searched as part of our sort of cluster searches. And we visit every single one from our collared wolves from April until November. So we literally go every spot that the wolves spend more than 20 minutes for that entire period of time, which is how we get a really good glimpse into sort of wolf predation behavior. And in this particular instance, the wolves spent a lot of time. Uh, in particular, you'll see on that map, there's two individuals, one's the green and one's the white. That's the breeding male and the breeding female. And they both were here and made this kill together. And there probably were other pack members as well. How many members in that pack that you're aware of? We don't know. Um, they had- We knew. We, 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 we did know. know. Last year they had six during the winter, last winter. Um, recent trail cam footage shows two, the, the breeding pair and a third member. Mm -hmm. The pack had six pups this spring. Uh, we have not been able to get a single pup on footage yet. And we suspect that maybe all of them have died already. That's unusual for us by now not to have pups on cameras. Yeah. The fact that there are none and none with the adults at this time is odd. But we have to do sort of a systematic review of our footage. You know, there's a lot of cameras. We haven't pulled the cards yet, so we don't know for sure. But the ones that we have reviewed haven't shown any pups. Um, and usually, at this time of year, the pups are all over the roads running around. And uh, usually it's not a secret that there's a couple still alive on our cameras. So we suspect that there could only be a couple members in this pack right now. Um, and then we also could find out by checking camera that we're actually wrong and there's like nine of them. Um, so, so we'll have to see how that that goes. But we know there was at least two here. Um, so the yearlings don't stay? Not long usually. Typically some of the yearlings will stick around to about a year and a half, two and a half. Every once in a while they'll stay to three and a half, but that's relatively uncommon. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes what you get in two and a half year old wolves is they kind of become uh, a term that they, people refer to them as floaters, where they're sort of loosely associated with their packs, so they're kind of hanging out around the territory, but then they're kind of leaving and going doing their own thing, and, and they're kind of there, and that's typically a sign that that wolf is going to disperse 
sometime soon, um, unless for some reason they're able to sort of become the breeding animal of the territory they're in, which is oftentimes doesn't happen unless their their parents die or something yeah. like that. So usually that's a sign that yeah they're going to go. Um, Do the parents ever drive them out? Or they so leave on their own. So that's a big question of what actually is what what causes wolf dispersal? Why do wolves leave? <clears throat> um, the prevailing, I think, thought right now is that it's primarily really strict competition from the parents and other pack members that force, essentially cause those individuals to leave and decide there's greener pastures elsewhere. And so the general thought is that um, when a pack has their pups of that year, those pups sort of become now the most important animals in the pack next to the breeding pair. So the bre breeding pair is going to preferentially let those pups feed on carcasses, etc. So that means if you're a one and a half year old wolf or a two and a half, you're now on sort of the, the bottom of the ladder. And so uh, you're not getting as much access to the food resources and particularly if food's sort of at low availability, you're gonna be the one who's not getting anything to eat. And that competition can be presumably quite fierce within the pack. And so that individual says like, I'm out of here because I'm gonna go elsewhere. Um, and so it's kind of like a forced they're not entirely runoff, even though there are documented instances of that, but there's idea that sort of just like realizing that you're like, I've got no future here. I mean, more or less, right? That's sort of like anthropomorphism, right? But they just realize like they could go elsewhere and it's gonna be better than, than where they're at. But what has not, what's not been shown yet, which is, would be interesting and something we're trying to get at is like, is it really better for them once they disperse, do they actually start getting more food by leaving? And no one's, just because of how challenging it is to study predation, it's hard to know, are they really getting more food when they go off by themselves or not, or maybe long term they get more. They're balanced and it's enough for a wolf to, to catch them. Um, there's all sorts of things. I, I suspect part of it is that it also allows the wolves to probably spread out and surround a deer in a little bit easier than they can in just running straight through the forest uh, when they hit this, but some of it definitely could be that. Um, you see a similar thing in the wintertime on lakes. Wolves will run deer out onto the lake edges and once there's something about that lake shore. Next, we went to an area where they had a game camera set out and at this place we saw lots and lots of wolf tracks and we also got a lesson on how they set their cameras. cameras because you can pivot it and get the camera set up exactly where you want it which if you've ever messed around with trail cameras can be extremely frustrating if you're using like a strap or something like that so they're kind of spendy they're like 20 bucks but they're just they're worth their weight in gold um then we obviously got a lock here but um one thing we just want to talk about because we get asked about it a lot is like well what do we do special that allows us to catch all this footage and really I don't think we do anything super special but there are a few sort of keys if you're deploying cameras that we think we're going to we're going to try to share if you're interested in doing this so a few and a few common mistakes that we see from people so one of them is that most people put their cameras way too high uh, when they're setting up their trail cameras most people come up to a tree and they say oh, I want to put my camera here and then they look it out like this and so in all, when they get animals, all the, the perspective is they're always looking down on the animals. Um, and if they put it too high and they're not looking down, then they're facing it on the vegetation and that blows around and their camera fills up with, with other stuff and then they never actually get footage of the animals they're trying to get footage for. So typically when we're trying, we're trying to get wolves on our cameras, obviously. So what we tell people working on our project is we want the camera to be set, this one's an exception, um, but we want them set at about our knee height so that basically when a wolf walks by it, it's looking right in the face of that animal. Um, in particular, when we're trying to get pups on remote cameras, we want those cameras to be pretty low so we can get wolf pups. In this instance, um, we have this a little bit higher and in part because there weren't any other really good trees here. And we had had six cameras stolen off of this main road and we needed to get some cameras in here. So we wanted to put some along this road because we know they use it. And so we just didn't have a lot of options. So we put one here, which is sort of subpar spot, but good enough to get wolves going back and forth. Um, <clears throat> ideally, we'd want a, a tree that was like literally right on this road and we would want to angle it down the road. Um, and that's another problem people make. So when you've got a remote camera, the sensor of that is basically radiating out from that camera is like a cone. Um, and so if you've got, if you put it perpendicular on a road, you've got this cone that's kind of crossing the road like this. So there's a short window when that animal enters that, triggers the camera, and then you get footage. 
Whereas if you put it facing down a road, that sensor will pick it up the animal a lot farther away and allow it to run down and you get a lot better footage of that animal coming through. The other reason why we really like these cameras is unlike a lot of trail cameras, the actual um, field of view of that sensor is actually wider than the angle of the actual camera itself. So the camera triggers before the um, animal actually walks into the frame so you get better footage. Not all trail cameras do that. And um, particularly older trail cameras had that problem where by the time that the camera had triggered, they just got the tail end of the animal and it's gone. So those are some of the things that have sort of helped us catch some of this footage. Um, a lot of it's also just trial and error. Putting out cameras, seeing if we get wolves in certain areas, and if we do, keep putting cameras there, and if not, we don't. Um, so there is sort of an art to it, I guess, and a lot of trial and error. But um, another thing, if you ever use cameras, use lithium batteries. These, all of these cameras work best with lithium batteries, which are way more expensive than um, your sort of standard uh, alkaline batteries, but they're really, really good for trigger cameras. Um, and our settings on our cameras, these take 20 second videos every time they're triggered, and there's a one second delay between each video. So in theory, if an animal's sitting in front of the, the camera, that's gonna keep triggering repeatedly until that animal's gone with only a minimal delay. So sometimes in our videos, you'll see like where the camera, the footage jumps a little bit, and that's just because there's a little one second lag between things. Um, so that's sort of our camera setup. Uh, in summary, sometimes you'll see animals sort of sniffing the ground in front of our cameras and people want to know about what what's going on there. You know, we just get, we're just that good. We know where they're going to smell the ground. Um, no, no, no. So we put a little skunk essence. Um, you can buy these like commercial trapping lures where, an, where people grind up all sorts of animal parts uh, and they smell. And so we use one that uses a skunk essence and every animal that's a predator likes smelling that. And the reason we do that is when wolves are running along roads like this, they're often just cruising, you know, and they're moving pretty good. And we want to be able to know which animals are actually traveling there, and we want to get a good look at them. So if you put a little scent down, they stop and obviously investigate it. Sometimes they'll scent roll and things like that, but it allows us to get a lot of information on those animals that we otherwise wouldn't get if they just sort of bolted by the video. Um, and oftentimes it'll allow us also to see like pups that are milling about in the area and things like that. Um, that we might not otherwise see. We saved the best for last, and the last was an abandoned wolf den. And we are at a abandoned wolf den site. Take them all out and um you 18 18 and 2020. Um so at least 4 years that we're aware of. Um, and what was really interesting to us is so for 2016 through 18, it was used by a pack called the Sheep Ranch Pack. That pack was booted out of its territory by in 2020 by a pack called the Huron Pack. So a different social group came in, took over this territory. And what was really shocking to us is then that pack used this den. Pack. So somehow that pack knew that this was a den to use, even though they weren't related and none of them had been in this territory before, uh, so far as we're aware. If you like this video and want to learn more about wolves, wolf dogs, and dogs, please hit the like button and subscribe.